How was uh, everybody's long journey? Amazing. Amazing. Great conversation. Uh, if there are any, uh, you know, problems or complaints, please, please pass those on to Father John. <laughs> or not me. So, awesome. So, uh, welcome back. I hope you all had a wonderful holiday break. I had a wonderful <coughs> holiday break. It was a uh, nice to sort of, you know, get settled and take a Wednesday night off. Uh, I'm sure you, you all agree. Uh, so real quick, let's review what we've gone through so far. We are all the way to the eighth chapter of John, and a lot has happened. We've learned a lot about who Jesus is as the Son of Man, as the Son of God. We've learned a lot about how he comes uh, through the waters of baptism. He gives us waters of, of rivers of new life, rivers of running life. Um, and we learned that uh, in chapter 7, all the way back in December, when Jesus was attending the Feast of Booths. Yes? Just speak up a little bit. Okay. So Jesus was attending the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Tabernacles. And can anybody tell me what the Feast of Tabernacles celebrates? Yes? The celebrating when... That's true. So the Feast of Tabernacles commemorates the period, uh, the 40-year period where the Israelites slept in booths or tents. They were in the wilderness for four years, and that is how they slept. That's how uh, their society uh, was operated. And here we have some pictures of uh, modern-day uh, tents that the Israelites uh, still sleep in. The Feast of Tabernacles is kept to this day uh, in Jerusalem. And so, Jesus is at the Feast of Tabernacles, and something very special happens on the last day. So on the last day, the big climax of the, uh, of the feast, the priests all go to the Pool of Siloam, which means sent, and they take water, and they come up, and they pour it on the altar in the temple. It is a huge, solemn seminary, uh, uh, event that, uh, that takes place. And during the middle of this ceremony, when the priests are pouring this water on the altar, Jesus stands up in the crowd and says, I, whoever believes in me, from them will flow rivers of living water. Making a reference to those who believe in him and are, ba and are baptized are saved through him. It's something amazing happening, and everybody is talking about it. Everyone in Jerusalem is saying, who is this amazing prophet? Who is this guy that goes on saying all these crazy, weird things? We want to hear more. We're intrigued. And chapter 7 ends with the, uh, the temple authorities and the Pharisees. They're all together, and they're arguing. And now, this guy isn't the Messiah. He's from Nazareth. Nothing good comes out of Nazareth. And so basically, from there, they condemn him. They see him as a threat to their power. They're a threat to his power. Uh, he is a threat to their authority, their dominance over the Israelites in the region. Because, as we learned in other lessons, the Pharisees considered themselves to be so morally perfect that they could exert their authority and subjugate the Israelites that were considered less perfect than themselves. They were kind of like the equivalent of like a religious street gang, if you can think of them in this case. At least think of them in that sense in this case. So Jesus has, uh, has generated a lot of enemies. And then we get to an important scenario where uh, Jesus is teaching in the temple. And all of a sudden, the Pharisees and the scribes, they bring to him a woman that they claim is caught in adultery. Now, this is sort of a kind of a controversial part of the Bible because in a lot of Bibles, it's bracketed. Does anybody have it bracketed in their Bible when they read this? Yeah? That's because in the earliest uh, manuscripts that we have of the Bible, the earliest full manuscripts we have are from around the 3rd and 4th century A.D., uh, this passage actually wasn't included. Or it might have been included, but it was actually found in the Gospel of Luke. It was kind of weird, and people didn't really get it. And so uh, the best ex ex uh, explanation that I found uh, came from St. Augustine, who basically was complaining that, this, that uh, people that don't know what they're doing are cutting this passage out of their Bibles and taking it out because they feel scandalized by it. So, 
The argument here is that this passage has been in the Bible, but the earliest copies of it that did include it uh, are lost to us. And so the earliest copies that we have are the ones that had this taken out. But this passage actually fits really well within the framework of the Gospel of John. In the Gospel of John, we have a, uh, a pattern, basically, that's followed, particularly in chapters like 7 through 10, 7 through 9, where you have, Je where Jesus has an encounter. And then following that encounter, there's a teaching. There's an exposition on who Jesus is. And so when you take this passage out, there's really no context for what follows in verses, uh, you know, chapter 8, verse 12, all the way to uh, 51, 59. Uh, there's, no, there's no context. And so this passage gives us a context for the theme that runs throughout these three chapters. And the theme for, this, uh, for these chapters is that there's a problem. Humanity is plagued with sin. It's deep within us. It's prevalent. There's nothing we can do because we've inherited it from the very beginning, from Adam's sin. And we are in the group of it. Humanity is plagued by sin, and we need a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus. So that's the context in which we find uh, this woman who's been caught in the act of adultery. And they drag her and put her before Jesus. So the Pharisees, they do this with a certain trap in mind. The Pharisees, uh, we find, are not concerned with justice. They're not really concerned with doing the right thing. Their intention here is to trap Jesus because they don't like him. They see him as a threat. And so they sort of give him a, uh, a, uh, a little test. And the test is, do you condemn this woman or not? Has she committed a sin and, and therefore worthy of death? Or not. Because the law says in Leviticus chapter 20, if a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall be put to death. And again in Deuteronomy 22, 22, which is kind of fun to say, if a man is found lying with the wife of another man, both of them shall die, the man who lay with the woman and the woman. So you shall purge the evil from Israel. So Jesus is coming, and he's claiming to be the Messiah, the promised one, the upholder of the law, the champion of the law. And therefore, if he is the Messiah, he's going to have to condemn this woman to death. He's going to pronounce judgment on her and send her to death. This is what the, uh, the Pharisees want Jesus to do. However, there is a bit of a catch-22. Jesus, there's a, uh, there's a problem if Jesus uh, does this. And that problem is the Roman Empire. Uh, at this time, the Roman Empire had stretched just about all around the Mediterranean, including Palestine, the land of Judea, where Jesus is. You got Jerusalem right there, that's where Jesus is. And when you were under the authority of the Roman state, your government, your religion, whatever, your city state, whatever you belong to, they no longer have certain powers. And one of those powers that they were not allowed was to, uh, uh, I guess, uh, commit the death penalty, to capital punishment, yes, to put somebody to death. They were not allowed to do that on their own authority. Only the Romans, only the Roman leadership could uh, put someone to death under the authority of Caesar himself. It was a big deal to put somebody to death. And the Romans were really good at you know, government and bureaucracy. They knew how to do it. So the Jews couldn't put Jesus, or Jesus couldn't put her to death, even if he wanted to. So if just Jesus officially condemned a person to be executed, he would be placing his authority on an equal footing as the Roman state, directly challenging the authority of the emperor. So if Jesus is going to uphold the law like the Pharisees want and pronounce judgment on this woman, that means he can legally be brought before the Romans, be tried as an insurrectionist, and be put to death, which is what the Pharisees ultimately want. They, you know, you can tell they, they're just like snickering and hoping that they can get him. Um, they just, they want, they want him gone. 
So, there's a response. Jesus, after hearing their accusations, <coughs> decides to get down and write in the sand. Kind of an odd response. Just imagine Jesus in the busy temple courtyard. He's surrounded by <coughs> disciples and believers, people that came to listen to him, to hear his words. And then on the other side, you have his enemies, the people that doubt, the people that need to see what's about to take place. This challenge to Jesus' superiority, this challenge to Jesus' wisdom. And so, as the suspense grows, Jesus starts riding in the ground, as the whole temple holds its breath. And so this sort of, uh, in this statement, this whole action, it's very later. Jesus isn't doing this just to annoy the Pharisees or make them uncomfortable, though I'm sure that is also what he was doing. So, first off, the, the statement that Jesus uh, got down and wrote in the sand, he knows that this was seen firsthand. This, uh, this style of narrative isn't seen anywhere else in the New Testament, nor anywhere else in the Bible, nor anywhere else in antiquity. In fact, uh, actually, this whole style, which is called no uh, novelistic realism, isn't really developed until the 19th century. So, people can say it's fictional, but then with this thing, with this statement, this very personal, this very realistic statement, have been added so late. The only answer, the best answer, is that somebody was there who saw this happen, that saw the suspense, and was therefore <laughs> able to record the suspense of what was going on, so that we can get this look into Jesus' character, into his mind, into how he operated, especially his relationship to the Pharisees. How did he deal with these people? And it shows us, it gives us this look into his character as someone who's also not very easily intimidated. He's in front of the authorities. He's in front of people that want to kill him, and they're crafty enough to do it, as we'll eventually see. But he's still not intimidated. He knows their hearts. He knows what's on their minds. He knows their plan, and he's not afraid. Finally, we have a reading from Exodus. And he, that is God, gave to Moses when he had finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai the two tablets of the testimony. The tablets of stone written with the finger of God. This is an argument, a conversation, a challenge about the Old Testament, about the law, which the Pharisees proclaim to be the guardians of. Jesus, bending down and writing in the sand, in doing that, he is making a claim to divinity. Jesus was the one wrote on those stone tablets. He was there on Mount Sinai. He wrote the law, and therefore he is Lord of the law. Jesus is making a claim to his divinity, not verbally. But the Pharisees would have gotten the point because they knew the Bibles. As St. Bede wrote, and Bede was a monk in England about 1,300 years ago, he wrote, When the Lord was about to give pardon to the sinful woman, he desired to write with his finger on the ground, in order to point out that it was he himself who once wrote the Ten Commandments of the Law on Stone with his finger, that is, by the action of the Holy Spirit. And it is good that the law was written upon stone, since it was given to subdue the inmost hearts of a hardened and defiant people. Are there any questions at this point?
not forsaking the Lord as their ancestors did. The and their ancestors forsake the Lord. They forsook the Lord. Forsake the Lord. Am I enough? Forsook the Lord. Thank you. Looks like everybody's saying enough. Uh, they turned away from the Lord. Man. <laughs> Their ancestors turned away from the Lord, and in doing so, they lost their land. They had, they had it taken away from them by the Babylonians. So finally, years later, they got their land back. But they were constantly, constantly oppressed by the Assyrians, by the Persians, by the Babylonians, uh, by the Greeks, and finally by the Romans, which were the worst of all. And so the intent of Israel, of all the Jews, was to maintain covenant faithfulness as best as possible so that the Lord would deliver them, hopefully in the person of a Messiah. But what Jesus is, Jesus is making sort of a cheeky statement in writing on the ground, um, and there's also often, a lot of people have speculated that what he was writing on the ground, and nobody actually knows what he wrote on the ground, but some people think that he was writing the names of the Pharisees that were in front of him. And that would have been a direct reference to this passage. <clears throat> Those who turn away from you shall be written <coughs> in the earth. And he's commenting on the Pharisees' hearts. They don't care about this woman. They don't care about covenant faithfulness. They care about being better than everybody else. That's what the Pharisees were about when they came up to Jesus. Because they felt personally <coughs>
They believe themselves perfect, but they also can't kill this woman. So what do they do? They have to admit in front of the crowd that they aren't perfect, and they have to walk away. So Jesus, knowing in their hearts that they are truly sinners, because of their pride, he makes them admit that sin to all the people gathered around in the temple, that they are in fact sinners, that they do not have the authority to pronounce judgment on this woman, because they themselves are imperfect. Pretty neat. So Jesus discerned the intentions of the Pharisees, that they were so concerned with complying to the letter of the law, they absolutely failed to realize uh, the truth of their own nature and their status with God. The people, they were so concerned with, you know, maintaining ritual purity and keeping the law and, and doing certain things on the Sabbath, that they failed to realize that they were being prideful, that they thought that they were the best, the biggest, that they were the ones that deserved power and deserved judgment. And in thinking that, they lost their relationship with God. So when they lost their relationship with God, they were blind to see God standing right in front of them, riding in the sand. That's the danger of pride. They were quick to point out and judge the wrongdoing of others, but were completely blind to the evilness that they had allowed to spread within themselves. How often do we do that? Do we judge? Or do we, do we judge others? How often do we turn away from our sin and sort of ignore it and then become blind to it so that we sort of lose that relationship that we have? I always find Christianity to be sort of a pendulum where one day I'm doing great and then the next day I find that I've completely lost the mark and then I'm swinging back and forth. That's sort of the life that we have. But as long as we're honest with ourselves, unlike what the Pharisees were doing, then there's always a chance for us to come back to the Lord. So to be qualified to make judgments, one must be without sin, and this disqualifies us all. Everybody knows the saying, take that speck out of your eye, uh, or the log out of your eye before you remove the speck from your neighbor. This is exactly what's happening, and the ultimate mic drop. Jesus keeps on drawing in the sand, probably adding a few cursive swirls to their hands as he's writing. <laughs> So, after this happens, there's a very powerful scene in the Passion of this golden turner. Uh, it's, that's where we get this picture from. Jesus says, he looks up, he says, hey, where'd they go? Does no one condemn you? And the woman says, no, Lord, they haven't. So the woman calls him Lord. In her humility, having just been called out for her sin, she recognizes that the person that she's in front of has the authority over her faith. She is dealing with not a mere man, but someone who's more than that. Someone who really can judge her. Someone who really is without sin. He is the Lord of Lords, the Lord of the Sabbath, and in this case, the Lord of the Law, because the Law comes from Him. But He has a Savior. And Jesus is even here holding the Law, which says that a person may only be condemned there's a valid testimony of our three witnesses. And so, having no one around, have they all having been scattered because of their sinfulness, Jesus doesn't condemn her either. So Jesus shows compassion and forgiveness here. But it's much more than that. We don't want to think of this as sort of a mere, oh, there you go, now get up, go on your way. Jesus commands her. He gives her a charge at this, um, telling her that or commanding her to not do sin. My favorite saying, or not my favorite saying, but it is a cool saying, and I didn't come up with it. Grace is free, but it's not cheap. Grace is freely given to us, but we can't make light of that. This woman committed, who committed adultery had a punishment that awaited her. Just like all of us who sinned, there is a punishment awaiting us. But thanks be to God, we have Jesus Christ. He 
comes to us and he tells us to go and sin no more. That's our charge. That's our command. Because when we encounter the living God, he demands change from us. That woman can't go back to her old ways, just like we can't go back to our old ways. But when we do go back to our old ways, we have to keep coming back to him. We have to keep crawling up to his feet and just beg our Lord for forgiveness. And he'll give it to us. So, we couldn't really get fully into the whole chapter. Uh, this whole talk has only been about the first 11 verses, and there's like 59. So, basically, and this is a big chapter, very weighty theologically. And in it, Jesus is saying that he is the source and author of the law. He is the light of the world and the revealer of truth. He's from above. He is the son of the father. He is the judge of the world. He is the redeemer of the world. He is the predecessor of Abraham. And he is the great I am himself. He is saying that he is God himself. And saying this, even before Abraham, I am. He is saying that he's this. He was the burning bush that spoke to Moses out of the fire. When he said, I am that I am. That's Christ. You know, we often don't think of Jesus as being in the Old Testament. We tend to think of the Father. That's where the Father is in the Old Testament. But Jesus is found throughout the Old Testament, always at work in his people. And this great I am moment is Jesus. So we find Jesus, who is the source of our salvation, was also the source of the Israelite salvation the whole time. But in, with Jesus saying this, everything just kind of blows up, like in chapter 6. Everything was going really nice and well. Uh, people were starting to gain interest. He was gathering a following. But then he started opening up about himself, and the people could understand him. So the people's reaction to Jesus, and including the Pharisees' reaction to Jesus, that stands in stark contrast to this woman who was caught in adultery and then forgiven her sins. So our message tonight is where do we want to stand when we come into contact with Jesus? Do we stand with the people who in pride don't think they need to be saved? Or do we stand with the people who know their sin, who know that they committed wrong? Come to the Lord and ask for forgiveness. To us, his message is clear. Go and sin no more. Now let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to know our sin. Help us to be aware of where we are blind and where we are prideful in our lives. And then, Lord, give us the grace to come before you in humility and ask for your forgiveness. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you all. <coughs>